I woke up in the middle of the night and my left knee right over my kneecap just felt real stiff. Like that patella tendon was just real tight. Tuesday comes around and it's now starting to look like I'm growing a second knee on top of my actual <laughs> knee. I was like, I think this qualifies to call that orthopedic doc. So I sent them some pictures and they said, yeah, we need you to come in today. He walks in and immediately looks at it and he just goes, oh fuck. By day four or five, my whole leg looked like a topographical map. They said, we're gonna do an exploratory incision tomorrow. We'll put you under for it, but we're just gonna make a small like two inch incision just to see what's right underneath the surface. The next morning, the doc comes in, he pulls the packing out and he said, hey, you have a flesh eating bacteria that is eating you from the inside out. Fucking alien jumped out of your leg. <laughs> Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. All right, so anyway, um, I get I get fucking sidetracked. I'm like the uh, the Afghan army guys picking fucking fruit over here. Um, so uh, you have that that seizure, you go back, you finish the deployment, mm -hmm. no no problems, mm -hmm. and then uh, what happened when you came back from that deployment? Um. Two weeks after I got back, I had seizure number two. Where were you at when that happened? I was at home. Yeah. Um, and was in my closet. I was hanging up clothes. And the next thing I know, I woke up on the floor. And at that point, my wife was home. My mom was in town visiting. So I couldn't really hide it. Yeah. I wanted to, but went to the er because again it was a prolonged seizure and if you seize too long like you're at risk for brain damage so went to the er they gave me some seizure medications said hey we're gonna start you on this but we're gonna set you up with a neurologist to see exactly what's going on with your brain so that started a couple month long process of brain scans and trials of different medications because after that I started having seizures regularly really um like multiple per week and uh was there an average duration of how long they would last or did it vary two to five minutes generally yeah. uh, was, I mean it's painful right like because you're or like a soreness I wouldn't say it's painful, but afterwards it feels like you ran a marathon yeah because Everything's all so your tight. muscles tense up so much yeah um, and I don't know the science behind what that does to, you know, lactic acid and yeah. all of that. But yeah, you wake up afterwards and it feels like you're hung over and you ran a marathon. Wow. Um, did you do the, the deployment not to Afghanistan before this happened? No. Okay. This is after. Okay. Yep. Um, so they did some brain scans and they did some prolonged brain scans, like 24 hours, 48 hours where you're wearing the skull cap with all the sensors. And then when they analyzed the results from those, they called me back and they said, Hey, your brain is constantly having seizure activity all day. They're not always turning into grand mal seizures, but you're having these little micro seizures throughout the entire day. And it's, one slip away from being a grand mal seizure and this is every time you have one your seizure threshold is going to get lowered and you're going to keep having them so we need to get you on medication to control these and what that meant to me was i can't be on an oda anymore obviously they don't want you gunning in a house if you're at risk to have a seizure so i the, the options I was given was I could go work a desk job for two years, take the medication, and if the seizures were controlled for two years, I could go back to an ODA. Every time I, I had a seizure and the medication's not, it's not like this is definitely going to work. It's, it's guessing. So they give me a certain prescription, a certain dosage, I'd have a seizure, okay, this one's not working, or we need to increase the dosage, have another seizure, okay, now let's try this, let's add this pill to it. After six months of that, and every time I'd have a seizure, that two-year clock gets restarted. 
So after six to eight months, I was like, I, I don't like this unknown. I don't, I don't want to be a green beret stuck at a desk for the remaining 10 years of my career. So I'm going to opt to close this chapter. So they med boarded me, which they had to start a med board as soon as I was diagnosed with epilepsy and TBIs. It's protocol. They have to start a med board. Now, at some point in that process, you can argue that and you can fight it. I chose not to. I was like, I'm ready to just move on to the next chapter in my life. If I was smart, I would have come up with a plan for what that looked like, but I wasn't smart. Yeah. So, because this is all like I wanted to do. Yeah. And, you know, as much as we say the military doesn't define us or this isn't my identity, to an extent it is sure. for everyone. Yeah. And especially when you work in SEAL teams, SF, Ranger Regiment, MARSOC. It's a big part of your identity. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're proud of it. Yeah. Because you went through some shit to get there. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of dealing with some of that, and I didn't really have a plan. And then that day came when the Army was like, okay, we're done with you. And I picked up my DD-214, and I was like, I have no clue what I want to do. So I had been using – I've always been a cyclist. I loved riding bikes. I was using that as an outlet to kind of work with some of my own demons. And I came up with the idea I want to ride a bike across America, raise awareness for veterans' causes. So – I put together a plan. I reached out to a nonprofit task force dagger and said, Hey, I want to do this. I want to raise money for somebody while I'm doing it. Can that be you? And they were excited about it. And they said, absolutely. So kind of the platform that I took, I had realized, so we had this medication that stopped my seizures. It was called Keppra and it worked. It stopped my seizures but it turned me into a nightmare. Really? Yeah. Like behaviorally? Behaviorally, like really <laughs> irritable, uncontrollable anger outbursts, uncontrollable depression, anxiety, everything. Wow. And these are known side effects for Keppra. Sounds like more, more like an effect, not a side effect. Yeah. But. All right. Hey guys, I want to take a, a second to talk about ads. Um, and this is not an ad. This is me talking about the ads. I know that um, you know, sometimes we get comments of, of people bitching about the ads. There's too many ads or they're too long or what have you. And I, I want to clear two things up, which is number one is that my slash our team's ability to bring you guests and, and bring them in and, and the accommodations and, and the entire process that it takes to produce these shows to the level with which we do uh, requires funding, you know, and the, the sponsors give us an ability to bring these shows to you. So while I understand that everybody wants zero ads and, and everything bunched together and, and what have you, this is how we, we bring this show to you. Uh, you know, we're a very small team. We're very fortunate to, to be able to do it, uh, but we do still have to, uh, to pay bills and, and bring that to you. So keep that in mind. That's the first point. And the second point is that I can assure you with 100% accuracy is that there is not a sponsor or a product that I talk about on here that isn't something that I use, okay, that, that I either regularly use or always use or have used, and, and I refuse to budge on that, okay? So we, we get uh, offers for, for sponsors regularly that, that get turned down because it's not stuff that I use or would use. So keep that in mind, uh, have a little bit of flexibility in terms of our ads and, and realize that... They're products that I believe in, that I stand behind, and they're what, what make this show possible. So if you support these advertisers, these sponsors, that is supporting the show. Thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. 
Yeah, and I had done my research and was like, this is definitely being caused by this medicine. So I told the doctors, hey, I don't want to be on this anymore. I'd rather have seizures and be on this. And they said, well, we can't take you off of it because now your body relies on that medication to control the seizures. If we remove that, you're going to have even more seizures now. So they sent me, you know, when you go through, even after you get out of the army for that first year or two, if you get out for medical reasons, you have to go to these mandatory checkups for them. It's kind of their way of saying, do we still need to compensate this guy for this issue or is it healed yeah. and we don't have to pay him anymore? So I was still having to go to these appointments and these are with a third party doctor. They're not affiliated with the VA. They're not affiliated with the army. This was just a random neurologist in Minnesota. I go up there, go into his office. We do the brain scan. He's reading through the results and he's like, yeah, you definitely are still having seizure activity, but the medication is controlling it from crossing over into grand mal seizures. So he's like, that's the end of our VA appointment. And he like stops the, the tape recorder that he's recording his notes on and takes his glasses off. And he's like, I want to have a real conversation with you now. Because I had told this guy, like, this medication... I'm going to kill somebody or I'm going to kill myself. Those are the two ways this is going to go. I'm going to be in jail or dead. And he said, we're going to have a side conversation. This is not affiliated with the VA. But he said, you should do some research on cannabis. And at that time, this was 2015. So... It wasn't, it wasn't as accepted as it is now. It was still kind of a taboo thing. Yeah. And I probably made it more of a taboo thing in my head because I was worried, like, what would my peers think? You, sure. You know. So, but I did, I did listen to him, and I went home, and I did some reading on it. And he had mentioned that there were some CBD strains that were non-psychoactive that were known to control seizures. And at that time, this was right around the time, I can't remember who did the story on it, but there was a strain called Charlotte's Web for a little girl named Charlotte that mm. had epilepsy real bad. And so I reached out to them and I said, hey, here's my story. I would love to try this. And they sent me some and an oral tincture. And I started using that and I got... I weaned myself off. I didn't stop taking the prescription drugs, but I weaned myself off of them. And I didn't tell any of the doctors about this. I was, I'm just going to see what happens. Never had another seizure. Wow. And so when I went on that bike ride, the, the approach I wanted to take was to really start opening up the conversation of non-pharmaceutical treatments for TBIs. And the task force dagger was about it they were like yeah let's talk about it so rode across the country i stopped in every active duty sf base across the country and then additionally went down to dallas where task force daggers headquarters at the time was and we had a, we had fundraisers at each base we had fundraiser in dallas and i got the chance to share my story and what this has done talk about the mental health side of everything that transition out of the army because I had no clue what that was going to look at. I think now, thanks to people like yourself, we have a lot of veterans sharing what that looks like. Once that identity is gone, that crossover into this new life and, and how, to, how, to, how to fight that. Like yeah. how to limit the effects that that has on guys. But at the time, there wasn't a lot of that. So I wanted to share that experience with everybody. And... It was, it was an amazing opportunity. Have you not had a seizure since then? So I went from October 2015 was the last seizure I had until November of 2020, so just over five years. And then I had a series of seizures, but that was because I had two strokes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, during that five-year period, you and I know that there's – a significant limitation to the details you can provide, but you did some contract work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how did, did you have to get cleared to do that or? 
I know we can't say who you worked for. I'm, I know people can fill in the in the blanks, but um, how how did that process for for what you can disclose? So I it wasn't as intense as when you joined the army. Yeah, it's they send you a physical form and you take it to a primary care provider and get everything that's on that form checked out. But you can take this to any primary care provider. So I left that part out Yeah, completely. I, I was confident, like, <laughs> my seizures are controlled now. And so I just went into the primary care provider, and I never made mention of it, and I never had a seizure while I was over there. Yeah. Was that the right answer? Definitely not. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, again, I, I, I want to be um, sensitive to, you know, what you can talk about. But th there was a – you went on a deployment that was pretty significant. Yeah. I ended up doing four more deployments as a contractor. Um, most of them were, were pretty mundane. Not a lot going on. But there was one in the middle where – we were specifically, the, the people I was working with were specifically tracking a high-value target. A really high-value target. A really high-value target. And it was every day, we, we basically had minimized everything down to where we were living out of backpacks. And at any time, the call could have came in that we needed to get out because we didn't have any support. How many of there were you? Maybe 40. Wow. At the time. Yeah. And... But we didn't want to lose our sight on this person. And we knew if we had to leave, even if it was just like for a couple of weeks until things calmed down, we would have lost sight of that guy. So we did everything we could to stay. And that meant bringing in military reinforcements. And luckily we brought in special operations guys that were under the, the, the military flag to come in and support us so that we could stay there. And ultimately we were able to accomplish what we were there for. And that guy's no longer breathing. Yeah. How much of the details of what went down can you share? So I wasn't a part of the, the actual assault on that. Um, I, I worked, I worked at the headquarters, um, which was, was just a small little compound that we had. And I got to facilitate putting the GPS tracker on that we used to yeah. capture. Do you know, uh, or can you, can you say like how you did that? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wish I could because it's a really cool uh, yeah. story. You, I mean, can you say how big the tracker was? Um, Ballpark? Like you, would never have known it was there. Really? Um, like we're talking a, a hair. No shit. Yeah. Wow. God damn, that makes me uh, really curious. <laughs> um, don't take that the wrong way. <laughs> the uh, man, that's fucking fascinating. But, you know, so again, I, I hate that we can't share it, but I, I get it. Um, you get, you guys can probably read between the lines, maybe not, but um, phenomenal fucking story. And and I guess for you. What was it like being able to kind of get back into the fight and, and play such an, an integral role in such a, a big operation after all the shit that you went through getting medically retired and having seizures and going through that whole fucking mess? It was awesome. It it gave me purpose again. I I wanted to be back around that community. I not found my place in in the outside world. And, and I tried. After that bike ride, I became an endurance coach for a gym. I was hit by a car during doing a triathlon during that time. I really tried to find my place. I was up in Minnesota, and Minnesota is different than anywhere else I've ever yeah. been in the U.S., I'm from Northern Iowa, like yeah. 45 minutes from Minnesota. So, I, so I you, you get it. It's um, as, as a straight white male, I felt like my presence was offensive to everyone. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's that way now everywhere, apparently. Yeah. You know, but that's a whole other fucking podcast. And, and he got Here's to a, the point. Have a Bud Light. Uh, like I, I didn't want to be around people because like – 
no one no one liked me i felt like yeah. um and i just had to really filter everything i said because every you know somebody would get triggered or yeah. you know everybody talks about trauma and like my take on a lot of people want trauma because it gives them an excuse yeah. to to, to give not up. fucking do anything yeah yeah or to blame yeah blame their problems or why they didn't fucking make it like i mean i've been through some shit but I don't want to, I don't want to play the victim because then that means that that thing has power over me yeah. and I want to make sure I always maintain power over any situation that comes my way. I agree. And I, I think, uh, you know, one of the, one of the most uh, powerful statements I've heard as it relates to that is don't trip over objects in the rear view mirror, you know, and, uh, it, you know, it's not to take away from things that have happened to people or, or to, to bury them. Cause that's not helpful either, but you know, the, the term processing, right, is is heavily used. Like well, I need time to process. But the the thing that I think gets forgotten is that is that that is a process, right? And and so it, it takes place and then it's done. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can't spend forty years processing something. Well, then you're not processing it. You're fucking dwelling on it. You know, and, absolutely. And I think that that's the most important distinction to make that people don't. They get in this hamster wheel of processing, and they and they never actually process it. They just fucking dwell on it, you know, forever, and and let it ruin their fucking life. But uh, what uh, for you in that kind of transitional period, going from medically retired, four deployments with government contracting stuff, and then ultimately now you're getting more into the endurance stuff. Um, mentally, did that take a toll on you, or and or how did you? Um, kind of fall into being in that environment and not get frustrated with, with all of that shit. Not getting frustrated with being in the environment where you're triggering everybody and you got to filter shit and like, I moved the fuck out of there. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I dealt yeah. with it. I made it about two years up there and <laughs> And that's when you got hit by the car. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it was actually like while I was in the hospital recovering from that, I looked at my wife and I was like, let's fucking go back to Florida. Yeah. And th like the other thing about Minnesota is there most people in Iowa is probably, I assume this way, tell me if I'm wrong. A lot of people don't leave there. Yeah. Their family, like they grew up there, their families, yeah. their, their parents grew up there. Like they're all live within like 25 miles of their, their immediate family and they're still hanging out with the friends that yeah. they made in high school. And so as an outsider moving up there, it's really hard to mm -hmm. find like your tribe or your community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whereas like California and Florida, it's like nobody's from there. Everybody's from somewhere else. Yeah. 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 No, and it like I still have friends that I still go up and see. And because not everybody was that way. I don't want to say the entire state was was that way. I still have friends that I care about and that I go up there and see and relationships that are made. One of my best friends and one of the guys that, that I have some future business ventures in the works with is from up there. Great guy. And he, but he's not from there. He's from Colorado. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, like I just didn't feel like I had a real community up there and you know, this coming from the teams and, and the same coming from SF, like, that community is what it's everything. Yeah. 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 Uh, what happened? Can you uh, tell us a story of when you got hit by the car? Sure. Um, so I was doing a half Ironman and I was on a relay team for this one. So one person was swimming, I was doing the bike portion and then somebody else was running. And I want to say the swimmer that was on my team, she was probably, I, maybe like fourth or fifth coming out of the water, maybe even sooner. So I was one of the first ones off on the bike. And I was, I want to say 30 to 35 miles into the course. And I knew I was at least in third place. So possibly second. And there was really one major intersection along the entire route. And they had briefed us the day before at the athletes briefing meeting and that morning that there would be traffic cones, there would be signs, there would be a police officer posted at every turn 
to make sure it was clearly marked. This turn, they missed that. And I didn't see a single cone. I didn't see a single sign. And it wasn't until the last minute, I or the last couple seconds, not even in the intersection, but in a parking lot of a gas station on the corner, there was a cop car and there was a cop outside messing with his lights on, on top of his car. And I was like, is this, am I supposed to turn here? Am I supposed to go straight? Because in, in triathlon, like you can't draft off of another rider. You have to leave so much space. So whoever was in front of me was out of my line of sight. And I yelled at that police, you know, but I'm trying to fucking win. That's in my blood. Like, so I wasn't slowing down. I was going to go through this if I needed to, but I yelled, Hey, is this, is this a turn? And he didn't respond. And I yelled it again. And when it was too late, he finally yelled, turn, turn, turn. But, and it was a right hand turn, but it was raining out. It was wet. I was going 20 to 25 miles an hour down a, a slight incline into this intersection. If I had tried to turn at that point, my bike would have slid out and I'd have been laying down in the intersection and more than likely a car would have gone over me. So I made that split second decision. I'm, I'm going to, I'm praying like, here we go. Let's hope I miss it. I saw that there was a car coming from, from the right and everything kind of slowed down and I had enough time to tell myself, okay, I don't want to face plant into this windshield. So I'm going to shift my body to the right so that if I do make contact with this car, I'll hopefully just roll over it. So my wheel hit basically right over their driver's side front wheel. And I did go over the handlebars, but I remember going over and bouncing off the car and I was still conscious. And I said to myself, that wasn't that bad if my bike's okay. And I had like started to apply pressure to the brakes to slow myself down. So I was like, if my bike is okay, I can still get on it and finish this race. All that went through my head and I still hadn't made contact with the ground. Jesus. So it was after like, the sixth time of seeing the sky and the ground because what happened was when I hit that windshield, it launched me straight up. And the the A pillar where the driver's side window and the windshield, that piece of metal that connects, that impacted this hip and it launched me straight up and I just started cartwheeling. And then I, I had enough time to think, okay, I've been off the ground for a long time, which means it's really gonna suck when I find the ground. Go, and I told myself, go limp. Don't try to catch yourself. Just let it happen. So went limp, and I landed on the left side of my face and skull, and then, like, my back scorpioned and lights out instantly. So woke up on a backboard. Cops and, and were there. Ambulance like, was coming ambulance might have even been there when i woke up but i was still outside of the ambulance i remember being awake when they lifted me in there and they're asking me all those questions do you know where you're at do you know what's your birthday what's your name who's the president what year is it you know and and i was fucking up some of those questions um they asked for my wife's number because my wife and daughter were like 10 miles back on the course cheering for me because I was going to be doing two laps on that course, I believe. And so they were waiting for me to come around the second time. And I gave them my first wife's name. Oh shit. Oops. <laughs> and they were trying to contact her and I gave them her phone number too. And I don't know if she answered or whatever, but it like came to me. Wally's holding the phone. I was like, hang that up. <laughs> I, was like, she, I was like, try this number. And her name's wow. Lindsay. <laughs> Damn, that's wild. I want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart. And that is a staunch supporter of this podcast, which is Bub's Naturals. Uh, the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to Glenn Doherty. His nickname was Bub. Uh, I did two platoons with him. 
and his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bubs Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bubs or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that, um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bubs brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers, uh, you know, the, the mission set on Veterans Day. They give 100% back. So uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee. The MCT oil powder, the same thing. Uh, it mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint, from a joint support, gut support, um, you know, MCT oil and collagen are, are two components, especially as, as we age, uh, that are integral components to, uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bubs Naturals and, uh, be able to, to work with them and, and sponsor a product that, uh, number one is a high quality product. And number two is, is so near and dear to, uh, you know, to my heart and to the mic drop podcast for, for who it, uh, was started for and what it stands for. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it's an amazing, amazing place to be. So, um, it is whole 30 approved. Um, it's, uh, sport certified, so you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, right now they're, they're offering, uh, 20%, <clears throat> 20% off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and, uh, use the mic drop code. So, uh, I really highly encourage you to, to try it out, incorporate it into your day, day to day for joint health, for brain health, uh, for cognition, for gut health. And, uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things uh, in Glenn Bubb's honor. So uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. Mic drop is the code 20% off. All right, guys, there's no getting around this fact. I carry, uh, a lot of people carry. Uh, if you do carry, you need to train. No different than fighting or uh, you know striking, shooting. It's all the same stuff. You, you have to train. Proficiency and safety are two things uh, that matter most. Uh, and I'm excited to talk about this sponsor, this new sponsor called Strike Man. Uh, if you've seen competitive shooters practicing timing drills on the range, imagine being able to do that at home. That's what you can do with Strike Man. Anytime you want without spending a dime on ammo, uh, that's what Strike Man does. It's a laser firearm training system that uses a laser cartridge, a target, and phone app that catch, captures all of your shots. The system's available in 16 different calibers from 9mm to 223 to 556. You can compete with friends, do clearing drills, use the timer to test your reaction speed all while the system scores your accuracy. It's a great, great way to dry fire and stay sharp without having to go to the range and waste ammo. Uh, right now, you can get 25% off by using the code RITLAND, that's one word, R-I-T-L-A-N-D, when you go to trainwithstrikeman.com. It's not an easier or more cost-effective way to do it. Again, that's trainwithstrikeman.com. Trainwithstrikeman.com. Offer code is RITLAND, all one word. Does your wife know that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... I mean, yeah, it is what it is. I yeah. was not in a clear state of mind. So she gave you shit about that. Not anymore. Yeah. Yeah. She did though. Huh? Yeah. yeah. But, um, so I get, you know, they knew they were like, this guy it has, a, has a concussion. My pupils were all fucked up and, but we really didn't know anything else. And I had been telling them my lower back and my right or my yeah right hip. Um, the other legs fucked up too. So I get confused. It was the right hip. I was like, there's a ton of pressure in here. So they, they had to drive me into Minneapolis and this was in Waconia. So it's like an hour long drive in an ambulance. And I don't think they gave me anything for pain or anything in that ambulance. By the time I got to the hospital, pain was pretty bad, but they were awesome. They didn't like, I didn't ask for anything. As soon as I got into that trauma one ER, because they had to take me to a trauma one. The docs were like, hey, we're going to get you more comfortable. Gave me something. And that was the first time in my life that I realized why people get addicted to prescription drugs. Yeah. Um, because I immediately felt like I was surrounded by boobs and puppies. 
And I was just yeah. like, oh, this is cozy. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that was short lived. It lasted for about 30 minutes. And then I was like, guys, this pain is getting worse. And they, we're essentially like, well, you were hit by a car. It's not going to feel great, but we can still give you more medication to make you comfortable. So they're trying to figure that out. They're stitching up my face. They're doing scanning my entire body. Um, and I didn't break my pelvis or my femur. And so the big stuff was ruled out. And that's where a lot of the pain was. So the concern, and they told me this, they said, the concern is that you have compartment syndrome, but we never see that without a fracture because of the way I was describing it. It felt like there was so much pressure that I couldn't feel my lower leg because this was like so swollen and they knew there wasn't a fracture though. So they just kept giving me drugs to try to make me more comfortable. It's internal bleeding. Exactly. Compartment syndrome is where you have so much damage to the soft tissue, but the yeah. fascia hasn't burst. Yeah. So there's nowhere for it to go. So that it's whole muscle pressure. just fills up with fluid and fluid and fluid until it eventually cuts off circulation to the limb and yeah. they have to amputate it. Yeah. So, you know, it, but I have a pretty high tolerance for pain at this point. And so I'm not making like a big deal. I'm not wailing. I'm not... I'm not screaming. I'm not crying. I'm just telling the doctor like, Hey, something is something's not right. Yeah. And they just kept writing me off. And then my friend, Danny, he's, he owns the gym that I coach at. He pulled the doctor out into the hallway and he's like, look, this guy's a green beret. His, what, what is it? What you expect a normal person to say is a 10. He's going to tell you it's a five. So I need you to disregard what he's telling you and treat this as if somebody is telling you it's a 10. So she comes in and she's like, Hey, I'm going to feel around on your butt for a minute. You're like, you're damn right. You are. <laughs> so she does. And she immediately, like she realized like my whole ass cheek and like the outside hip flexor quad, like everything here was like rock hard. And she tells me we're going to send you in for another CT scan. Compare that to the one that you did a couple hours ago when you first got here and see how much fluids built up in that leg. So I went in the machine. By the time they got me from the machine back into the room, they were like, Hey, we need you to sign these forms. You're going in for emergency surgery right now. Wow. So yeah, they decided that it was compartment syndrome. The whole leg was just filling up with blood and it had nowhere to go. Um, I went under, I woke up eight hours later, I immediately rolled over and looked and there's just an incision that's like 24 inches long that goes across my lower back, top of my ass cheek, to my hip, and then down this leg. Damn. So, and, it, and it's just wide open. They didn't sew it up and there's like a sponge shoved in there with a hose coming out and it's just sucking fluid out. That's fucking gnarly. So... I wake up with that, um, and then they kind of brief me, hey, this is what happened, and it was, it had progressed so much by the time we opened you up, like, if we would have waited until tomorrow morning to make that determination, you wouldn't have that leg at all. Wow. So, so yeah, it was a good thing that, that my buddy Danny pulled them outside and, yeah. you know, slapped some sense into them, but... Yeah, ultimately, I I rehabbed through that. You know, the other issue was I had a fracture in my L5, and then I fractured my skull. But they told me, hey, we can put a plate in there. Um, but I wasn't good looking to begin with, so I was like. So, that, so you didn't have him do it? No. You didn't want to go full Cousin Eddie? No. Yeah. No. Uh, how long did it take you to like rehab to the point where you were pretty much back to normal six months oh wow so i i didn't sit still very well when i got out of the hospital i was using a walker i was in a wheelchair for a little bit and then i got into a walker and I used that for maybe a month and then went to a cane, used that for maybe a month. And then I was like, okay, I'm good. And then 
I would get back on my bike and start just like, you know, soft pedaling around the lake on the bike path. I'm not, I'm not out trying to do, you know, intervals or anything like that. Like I just wanted to get my leg moving, but the impact of walking long distances or trying to run was too much, but I could at least just go spin my legs on a bike and get me outside. Yeah. So yeah, I think that helped a lot, but I didn't want to ride psychologically. I did not want to ride on the road around cars. So I would only do, I would only get on a bike and still to this day, I only like riding a bike in a controlled environment where there's yeah. no vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of mountain biking. A lot of mountain biking. Or if there's like an actual designated bike path and not just like a bike lane on the yeah. road. But like in, in Louisiana, we have this levee bike path that there's no cars. It's just for pedestrian traffic. I, I'll go out there and it's like 15 miles long. So I can just each way so I can get out and just do, do lengths. Many, yeah. Yeah. You get hit by the car, you rehab, you get back to normal. You end up doing your deployments after that mm-hmm. um, with, you know, you're obviously ca- capable of doing that. And then as your good luck would strike once again in 2020, um, you get a flesh eating bacteria and you end up having two strokes and more seizures. Mm-hmm. So uh, walk us through that if you could. So 2020, hit and COVID became a big thing. I was overseas when the whole COVID started. And at first we didn't think it would really affect us as I think most people in the world thought, but it got to the point where no one was allowed to leave base, minimal contact. It eventually got to the point where like you couldn't go to the gym, but there were certain times like, it kind of became like prison where there was like an outdoor gym space, but only so many people could go. And so you were allowed out of your room at certain times to go use that facility. And then you had to be back in your room. And there were people that would bring food to your room so that you didn't have cross contamination and they did everything to try to minimize it. So at that time it turned into, we only need, very minimal personnel to stay. And I had already been in country for like two months. So, and there were some guys that just got there like the week before that call was made. And I made the decision, Hey, let them stay and make some money. I made some money to live off of for, for the next couple months, which we didn't know that it was going to turn into the pandemic that it became. So I opted to come home, let other guys stay and I got home and pretty quickly things started shutting down around the U.S. I was living back in Florida at this point. So they shut down like every activity, but outdoor activities were still allowed. So I went kayaking just to get out of the house, do something physical, enjoy nature but I had also just recently gotten some tattoo work done on my leg. So probably not the smartest idea, but I always thought that was like a recommended thing for the healing process of the tattoo. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before. And so, you know, didn't expect it to happen now. What part of Florida? Up in the Panhandle, okay. just north of Panama City. Yeah. So still pretty swampy. It was a natural springs, but um, you know it's Florida, so there's all kinds of like meth needles and shit floating around in the water. So I went kayaking, had a good time, um, and then three or four days later, I woke up in the middle of the night and my left knee right over my kneecap just felt real stiff like that patella tendon was just real tight Mm -hmm. and it wasn't debilitating it was like I I woke up and maybe took some Tylenol and like walked around the house and stretched trying to loosen it up and got back in bed fell back to sleep for like two hours woke up and it was significantly worse at that point so then I started thinking maybe Maybe And it was red, it was inflamed, it was hot to the touch. I was like, maybe something bit me while I was sleeping, spider, something. So I went to an urgent care just to get checked out to be safe. And they looked at me, and at this point, you know, 
I was I was still pretty fit. I was six three and about two hundred and fifty pounds. So they looked at me and they said they did some blood work, but everything came back normal. And they said I think this is just an overuse injury. You either stri- sprained your patella or you you got bursitis in your knee were what they thought it was. So they gave me steroids to treat it and get jacked. Yeah, <laughs> not those steroids, I, I but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they gave me steroids to treat it and sent me on my way, but told me if it continues to get worse, follow up with this orthopedic surgeon. That was on a Sunday. And Tuesday comes around, and it's now starting to look like I'm growing a second knee on top of my (laughs) actual knee. So I was like, I think this qualifies to call that orthopedic doc and, and get a second opinion. So I called them. And they told me, yeah, we can get you in in two weeks. And I was like, I don't think this is going to last. Like, I could barely put weight on the leg. I couldn't bend it at all. You have pictures and shit of that, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have pictures that the doctors took during the surgery, too. Oh, wow. um, yeah, any, any pictures, video of anything that you've talked about, we'd love to put it into the YouTube. For sure. Yeah. So <laughs> I... Called them. They said, we can get you in in two weeks. I was like, this isn't going to wait two weeks. They asked if I could email some pictures of it over to them. So I sent them some pictures, and they said, yeah, we need you to come in today. So as soon as you can get up here, we'll we'll get him to see you in between patients. So I showed up. He comes in. At that time, all I could fit over my leg were Ranger panties. So he walks in and immediately looks at it. And he just goes, oh, fuck. Really? That's always a good sign. (laughs) Thanks, Doc. (laughs) Fucking inspire confidence. So he says, we're going to admit you into the hospital. He said, that's definitely infected. And we need to get you on IV antibiotics right now. He asked me, when did this first start? And I said, Sunday was when I noticed it. I went to the urgent care. I didn't even think to tell him that they injected steroids into it. I didn't think it mattered. Um, I said, but they, they told me they thought it was bursitis. They sent me home and told me to follow up with you if it didn't get better from rest, ice, compression, elevation, basically. And so the, I get to the hospital a couple hours later. They admit me into a room. They told me plan to be here for one to two weeks on IV antibiotics. And they they assured they reassured me that this is we, we're catching this pretty early, and so IV antibiotics should take care of it. But it's more than oral <clears throat> antibiotics can do. Yeah. So they said we'll be, we'll start you on a regimen here. If things are going well, we'll put a pick line in and send you home, and you can do your IV antibiotics from home probably for another four to six weeks, and then you'll be good to go. After four or five days in the hospital, every day, so they would mark the outline of the redness. And then later that day, they would come in, see if it's spread, and mark the new outline. By day four or five, my whole leg looked like a topographical map Wow! with just new circles. And at this point, it was like from my hip to my ankle. So... They said, we're going to do an exploratory incision tomorrow. We'll put you under for it, but we're just going to make a small, like, two-inch incision just to see what's right underneath the surface, what the flesh looks like, what kind of fluid's in there. So they did that. I woke up from the surgery. They did that late at night, though, so I didn't get any immediate answers. I didn't know what they found. The next morning, the doc comes in. They didn't sew it shut. They just packed it, and so he pulls the packing out. And this is the first time I could actually see what was going on. And he said, hey, you have a flesh-eating bacteria that is eating you from the inside out. Fucking alien jumped out of your leg. Jesus. So, and he told me, he said, when I made that incision, it looks like somebody opened the dishwasher mid-cycle and a bunch of dirty dishwasher fluid and spaghetti sauce spilled out of your leg. Damn. So... He said, we stopped right there, but today we're going to do another procedure and we're going to open up your entire leg and we're going to scrub everything between the skin and the, the muscle mass wow. in there. 
and we're going to scrape out all the dead flesh that is already eroded. We're going to sprinkle some antibiotic powder in there, and then we're not going to close it up. We're going to pack your whole leg with wound vax. And that's the whole thing, like from your hip to your ankle, is wide open? So from about mid-thigh to just below my knee, wow. um, probably we can... For a foot? Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe a little bit more. Yeah. Um, was one incision, and then there were incisions on the sides of my calves on both sides, and then from my ankle on both sides. So this big one, he would reach his arm all the way up to his elbow and scrub out from my hip down. And then those little ones, they used like surgical toothbrushes and stuck those in there and scrubbed everything real good. All right, as you guys know, the lifestyle changes and the, and the fast pace that we live, uh, it makes it difficult to get in, uh, you know, all of the vitamins, minerals, fruits, vegetables, etc. cetera. Uh, started working with first form. Uh, it's a great company. Uh, everybody knows who they are and, and uh, I've been trying their stuff for a while now and I, I love it. Uh, in particular, their Opti greens 50. It's a precisely formulated green superfood powder, uh, that increases overall immune system support and digestive health. Uh, 80% of your immune system is located in your gut and digestive tract, so healthy digestion is essential for overall health and wellness. It's got 50 hand-chosen ingredients, um, and it's taste and texture like no other product. It's not gritty. It's got a sweet berry flavor. Uh, 100% of all the greens ingredients are grown and manufactured in the USA. Um, you know, for me, this is a, a really good one-stop shop to uh, to get all the extra stuff that you need. There's a lot of greens out there. This is uh, a product I stand behind, I take, I enjoy it, uh, and and notice a remarkable difference in uh, just overall the way that I feel. My my gut health and digestion is uh, is noticeably improved. It's a green superfood blend. It's a phytonutrient blend. Uh, it's a glycemic balance blend. It's not going to spike your your blood sugar. It's got digestive enzyme blends and probiotics in it. It's a great product. Uh, Andy Frizzella and, and First Form is a phenomenal company that uh, you know is very supportive of the veteran community. And, uh, I just, I can't say enough good things about him and the company. So Opti Greens 50, uh, just a, a great product. And, uh, they're, they're a fantastic sponsor and supporter of Mike Drop. Dude, the, the post-op fucking trauma and pain from that had to be God awful. So that's an interesting story. I woke up after maybe the second procedure and my body went into shock yeah. from from the pain. And so after that, because they had to do this every three or four days Fuck, for months. And so after that second one, the second one that I think is the first time in my life, in my adult life, where I cried from physical pain. Yeah. Like just broke down. I, mean, I, I can see that kind of duration, like that testing your will to even want to fucking stay alive a hundred percent yeah a hundred percent you just be like dude this isn't worth it fuck it yeah so <clears throat> but after that second one so i woke up and i just started crying and <laughs> i was like at this point like i i swallowed my pride and they're like is everything okay i was like it just fucking hurts real bad <laughs> yeah, and, and it's not like they can keep you hopped up on fentanyl that whole time. Right. Because, you know I mean? like, they would give me fentanyl pre and post surgery. And then throughout the night and the days that I didn't have surgery, I was getting morphine, Dilaudid, Percocet. So I was on like the whole gamut. Yeah, and then like, surgery days, I'd get fentanyl. Yeah. But what they started doing, because they wanted to keep my body from going into shock from that pain, is as soon as I would start to come back from the anesthesia, they would immediately hit me with ketamine and I would go back into this dream state for like 30 minutes. And then you kind of fade back into reality from that. And so it's not this immediate shock to your system. And right. during that time, they can adjust the pain meds. If they need to give me more fentanyl and they need to give me more Dilaudid, they can do that. And then the pain's under control and I don't go into shock. Wow. The entire process from the very first surgery until the last was 10 months? So as far as cleaning out the actual infection, that was about eight months. Eight fucking. So for eight months, you were on high, high doses of opioids. Yes. So, I mean, how was that coming down off of that? Like A nightmare. Yeah. I mean, that like that's like heroin withdrawal 
absolutely type shit right absolutely and to talk about your your previous point i had lost that will to fight so there was a period of time where i was not taking all of my opiates and saving them and taking them at once so that i would hopefully not wake up the next day cheeking the medication yep yeah yep holy fuck did, was there a, ever a point where you considered or asked or explored the possibility of just amputating to not? I asked multiple times. Yeah. So even, so eight months to get the infection cleared out. But then after that, there was still another year and a half of reparative surgeries of the leg. It had eventually spread into my blood and got into my heart and into my bones. And so it just started chewing tendons off the bones so like my bicep now is no longer a bicep it's some dead person's calf and achilles tendon no shit that they grafted in there um so there were a lot of reparative surgeries which afterwards were back on on opiates for a period of time but by that point with the reparative surgeries i had kind of learned my lesson and so i took them when i needed to but then i got off of them as soon yeah. as i felt like i could um, that after that initial eight months, though, there was definitely a, an, an addiction. Yeah. Um, did you know it? Yeah, because I would start to try to come off of it and then I'd have a bad day where pain was worse and I would go right back up to the highest dose that I was prescribed. And what were you taking? Um, Dilaudid, Percocet, and time-release morphine. So they would prescribe a bunch of that to you, and you could just take it how you, however you wanted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and then they would even, you know, a month, two months, three months after surgery, because of everything, you go to a doctor, and they, they look over these medical records, and they're like, holy fuck. And so then they just would be like, whatever you need, man, just tell me. And so like, I realized I was asking for more narcotics when I really didn't need narcotics. And I, I, what I needed was someone to tell me, Hey, you don't need narcotics. But because this was something that they're not used to seeing, they're like, we're not going to argue with this dude. We're going to just give him what he needs. And so that was when I realized like, Hey, I'm not taking these anymore for the pain I'm taking this because of the dependency that my body has on them. Wow. So how, how long were you, would, would you say you were dependent on pain meds that way? By March of 21. So nine months, so about a month after the hospital, um, I had, they, so about five months into all this in November. So this started June of 2020, November of 2020. I was, I had been moved from Florida hospitals up to Boston and I was up there. And one morning I woke up and I got out of bed to take a piss and like the lights went out. I went completely blind. I lost all feeling to the left side of my body and was just super confused. And I found the pager. I buzzed the nurse. She came in and I just started crying. I was like, I don't know what's going on. I can't see anything. I can't feel the left side of my body. They took me down for an MRI. By the time I got back upstairs to my room, they were packing my stuff up and they said, hey, we need to move you back down to the ICU. I was on a regular floor. I'd been upgraded from the ICU to a regular floor at this point. Were you in Boston because they were special the specialist for what you needed. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. Yep. Um, and Florida, the hospitals in Florida in the region I was at, I had exceeded all their care. And so they had made the recommendation to move me to a higher care facility and the VA wouldn't sign off on it. Mm. So essentially what that's nice of them. Yeah. Essentially what they said was we've spent enough money trying to keep this guy alive and their answer was, let's move him to an assisted living facility and we'll keep him comfortable until he dies. Holy fuck. Yeah. So how did you circumvent that and get to Boston? A nonprofit that works specifically with contractors reached out and said, hey, <laughs> we have a trauma team in Boston that works. They're the best in in their fields. And 
we would like to get you up there if you're willing. And I said, yeah. And then initially it was going to be taking a commercial flight, but at this phase and everything due to the infection, I was rocking like 105 degree fevers on a daily basis. Man. So, and this was peak COVID. So this was when they're checking your temperature at the airport before they allow you to get on a plane. Yeah. It's like, nobody's going to let me get on a plane. So a good friend of mine reached out to the CEO of his company and said, Hey, will you let this guy use your private jet to get to Boston? So I got flown up to Boston on this private jet. Wow. Um, they picked me up like, you know, uh, suburban pulls right up to the plane. They put me in that, take me straight over to the hospital and inpatient I go. Yeah. So they moved me back to the ICU because they found out I had two strokes within the last 24 hours. I was in there. They had called my wife and said, Hey, you need to get back up here. We don't know if he's going to be around for much longer. So she, she was down in Florida with our daughter. She had been coming and going like every other week, spending a week with me, a week down there. And we had friends and family with our daughter when she was up in Boston. So she'd just flown, down, out, flown back home like the night before this happened. And then she gets a call and they're like, you need to come back. So she gets right back on her plane, comes back up, shows up at the hospital. I think she had picked me up some food. I was still alert but i still couldn't feel the left side of my body and i still couldn't see anything so she had picked me up some food on her way to the hospital and she walked in and i like she stepped out for for something maybe to use the bathroom or whatever but while she was gone my right leg just starts kicking violently and i'm aware though it, it started as like a muscle spasm and then started kicking more violently and then my leg just starts to like raise up out of the bed but I can't control it I'm like trying to push it down and I can't control it so I buzz the nurse and this nurse comes in and they're like hey what's going on and I'm like I don't know what's going on but I'm not doing this and then as soon as I said that I felt it like start to come up through my torso so this was a very different seizure than anything i had had before because i right. this is the first time i like felt it coming yeah. but i i knew something triggered in my brain as i felt it kind of coming up and into my head i was like i'm about to have a seizure and then it was lights out except this time i woke up and i was like how long was i out for and they were like six hours holy shit and so apparently I had started seizing to the point where they were like, he's going to be brain dead from this. And they, I think I, I, I flatlined while I was in there. They didn't even realize my wife was like curled up in the fetal position in the corner of the room while they're bringing me back. And finally somebody was like, get her the fuck out of here. And they escorted her out. But yeah, the seizure went on to the point where they really thought I was going to be brain dead from it. And they had to give me so much of whatever medicine it was that they used to stop the seizure, which it's a type of benzo. I don't remember the name. It's not Xanax or Valium, but something in that family. Um, they had given me like the max dose. Like they were like, we can't give him any more. If this doesn't happen, we have to call it. And luckily it stopped. So I woke up, and at this point, they were like, has this ever happened to you before? And I was like, yeah. And I hadn't disclosed any of that since I got out of the Army. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, really, I'd, at this point, I'd kind of, like, forgotten that seizures were an issue. Yeah. So I said, yes, it, has, it hasn't in, in five years, but I have had this before. And we talked about that, and then they do all the the brain scans again, the EEGs and everything like that. And they said they did it for like 48 hours. They tracked my brain patterns for 48 hours, and they came back, and they were like, so within the first 10 hours, you had 28 more seizures. Yeah. But um, do you know, were the, were the strokes induced by the opioid dependence uh, or do, do you know why that? So 
from what they told me, they found a small hole in my heart that separates the left and right side. I think it's called a PFO. Um, it's what Teddy Bruschi had mm. from the Patriots oh, okay. that caused him to have a stroke. So because I had had so many surgeries throughout this time, they think that a blood clot went up, passed through that, and then shot up to my brain. Wow. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's all we know. But yeah. I, within two weeks, my vision had come back. And I think about that same time frame, the numbness of the left side had subsided. And I mean, that's remarkable. Other than I, I still notice it sometimes in my speech, but for the most part, I've recovered completely. Wow. I mean, that's pretty rare, right? I th- yeah. Yeah. I mean, like to have multiple strokes and a fuck ton of seizures and fully recover and have no, I mean, there's no visual. Like I, if you hadn't told me that, I'd have never, never known or guessed or thought that you had had any of the things that have happened to you happen to you. Mm-hmm. You know, if I didn't know that, mm-hmm. and like I, that seems pretty rare. <clears throat> yeah, but yeah, um, man, that's wild. So total time was from when you initially went in with the infected leg until you were basically out of the woods and back to normal was how long? So. Infection was gone by March of 21, so nine months. But then reparative surgeries continued until May of 22, so almost two years. And 30 surgeries? 30 plus. Yeah. Yeah. Two strokes. Mm -hmm. I hope that fucking tattoo was worth it, young man. I still haven't finished getting that leg yeah. done i had all the outline work done yeah and now i'm just too shy to go yeah. in and get it colored yeah i, I don't doubt it <laughs> i have gotten mind. tattoos since then but i've left that leg alone the yeah. nerves are all fucked up now yeah. and Fuck. certain areas are super sensitive i can ima- i can't even imagine uh, speaking of tattoos you're an army guy you have a pretty pretty navy-esque tattoo on your hand come sail away all right so That's dad's nice. favorite song yeah it's a bond like i said it was my my fondest childhood memory was based around that song and shortly before he died me him and my sister all went and saw sticks together in oh, concert wow. and so when he passed away in 2009 i got that as cool. as a memory yeah. of him that's cool yeah. it's a nice watch too by the way it's like we have, they have the same taste <laughs> nice um man that's uh, what a fucking remarkable story i mean so that was not that long ago um from the time that you kind of made the full recovery until as you sit here, have you made further progress physically, mentally, cognitively, um, or, or have you relatively soon after there, did you get to a point where kind of where you're at now? Um, so it's definitely been a process from the mental standpoint. It, that was the longest yeah. process. I think, you know, it, it went from, being in the hospital and hoping that I wouldn't wake up the next morning, actively trying to not wake up the next morning, to even after I got out of the hospital, I, I had a suicide attempt. Really? Yeah. How, how so? Um, was just sick of living, sick of fighting, sick of feeling like I was a burden to the people around me. I had some bad decisions that I had made in my life that had caught up to me and I just didn't want to deal with it anymore. So can you share what the bad decisions were? Women. Oh, okay. Yeah. Enough said. Yeah. (laughs) I gotcha. Um, So I, I just, I didn't have any more fight left in me and I didn't want to leave a mess for my family to clean up. So I drove out into the woods. I had a pistol in my car in case, but I also had a garden hose and found a a dirt road that I didn't think anybody ever went down and tucked my car back there. And somebody saw my headlights, a patrol officer that happened to be driving in the area and was like, what the fuck are they doing back there at this time of night? And he came back and found me. Well, the hose, were you trying to asphyxiate yourself or what? Yeah. So just run it back into the car? Yep. Were you unconscious when he found you? No. No. What, um, how did that interaction go? Uh, he showed up 
and it was pretty obvious what was taking place. And they were kind of assholes at first. And I wasn't in the mood to really tell them why I'm doing this. But I did try to talk them into, like, hey, can you just take me back to my house? And no, that wasn't an option. So they they did the, the mandatory 72-hour hold or whatever, took me to the hospital. The next morning... I met, so actually, this is this is kind of a funny story. So that night, I got in at like 2 o'clock in the morning to the hospital. And they put me into a room. I didn't sleep at all. I just laid there staring at the ceiling. Next morning, they bring in the trays for breakfast. I go out, get my tray. There's also one, like, community phone that people can use to call home. So I used that phone, called my wife and said, hey, this is where I'm at. She had no clue. Then it's some dude in there that was coming down off more than likely meth decides like in his head, I think he thought he was in prison and I need to assert dominance. So (laughs) he just like comes up for no reason and just like shoulder checks me. And I was like, I'm trying to get the fuck out of here. So because this like mental hospitals, like, For me, at least, that's going to drive me to the point of being, like, if I'm not already there, put me in there, and I will be to that point. So I'm just trying to get out of there. And I'll come back. I'll talk to the docs. I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. Just get me the fuck out of here. So comes up. He shoulder checks me, and I just was like, all right, I'm making eye contact. And then I just let it go. Well, then I sit down. Some female patient comes and sits at my table. Same dude now thinks like, oh, he's getting all the attention from the girls. So he comes over and he grabs my tray and chucks it. Is there not any staff observing this? No, they were, but they didn't do shit about it. So after that, though, they did finally come and they gave him some medication to calm him down. As they're trying to give him this medication, he grabs a female nurse and he's choking her out and nobody's doing anything. So I get up and I run over there and I just jump on this dude and I held him down until security did come in. They restrained him. They put him in there and then they came over to me afterwards. The the nursing staff did and they're just like, thank you. Like, I don't know where our security was, but thank you for handling that. That could have gotten bad really fast. They lock that guy in a padded room, give him, you know, a couple shots or whatever, and he sleeps. But then they have to move me out of that floor because once you have a conflict with another person, you can't stay there. So they're like, we're going to, they're like, we appreciate you doing that. There were no repercussions to it. They weren't punishing me. They, They just moved me to a nicer floor, actually, and they rushed my interview with the actual doctor then. So a couple hours later, the doc calls me in. He's asking me, like, what led to this? And he's going through my medical charts, and he's like, are you still taking this medication, Keppra, seizure med? Which they started, put, they put me back on it after I had the seizures in Boston. Even though I told him, hey, this makes me fucking nuts. Yeah. And... But they're like, well, right now we need to control these seizures so we can worry about that later. So he said, are you still taking that? And I said, yes. And he said, do you notice any side effects from it? And I said, yeah, this. This is the the side effect. It makes me either want to kill myself or kill somebody. And I can't fucking control it. And he was like, that's really, he said, the way you describe that is a really common side effects of this medication and he said that's why you feel this way and so he called my wife he talked to her he explained all this to her he asked do you feel like you can keep him safe at home she said yeah so they only held me for like 14 hours it was supposed to be a 72 hour hold but once I talked to them and I was in a clear headspace at this point they realized like hey this guy's not crazy he's not a drug addict he's not 
necessarily suicidal. He's just going through a lot, and this medication is making it seem like overwhelming. When was this? This was December of 2020. Okay. So I had gotten back from Boston. Boston had released me, and I was back in Florida. Okay. And I still had to go into the hospital for a couple more procedures um, in February of that year. And after February was when the infection was cleared from my system. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, so that mental piece was, was the longest, hardest struggle. Yeah. The physical piece, I, I never did. I did physical therapy when I was in Boston. Um, and I had awesome physical therapists up there. I was working out next to the captain of the Boston Bruins. Oh, no shit. Yeah. So yeah, it was cool. like, it, it was actually like really motivating while I was up there. But then when I got back to Florida, it's back to the VA health system. Yeah. And they just want to make sure you can sit <clears throat> and stand without pain. They don't give yeah. a fuck if you want to run, if yeah. you want to ride a bike. Yeah. You know? So I just took that into my own hands and sure. just slowly started just getting yeah. getting back after it. Yeah. Uh, since the episode of having the strokes and seizures, have you had any seizures since then? Nope. Yeah. Are you back on the CBD and not the Capra stuff? Mm -hmm. How, what's that regimen look like? I do an oral tincture in the morning and the evening. And then sometimes in the afternoon, if I start to feel like tremors coming on, anything like that. I'll take it just to be safe. And is it still a Charlotte's Web? Um, so for the longest time, it was a brand called Tactical Relief. It was a veteran-owned company, um, but you can't find that anymore. So I just look. I know what terpenes hmm. are, are good for me, and I just look for the right any stuff. oral tincture, non-psychoactive. I got nothing against psychoactive cannabis either yeah i just there's a time and a place for it and where i'm at in life right now it it's not stopped it. serving me yeah i was for a while like that is what i used to get off all the opiates oh i got you um but now it tends to cause it, it, it makes me anxious because i've got shit going on in my life again yeah. that i don't want to take away from that yeah i don't want any distractions so sure. yeah. try to keep that clear head but every once in a while you yeah. know <laughs> yeah <laughs> when in rome um so going through i mean you got a remarkable fucking story there's no no two ways about it i mean i just story after story after story i'm i'm reeling hearing you explain everything that you've been through and that has led you to become an advocate for um you know i mean substance abuse, mental health, um, you know, mental issues within the veteran community using non-pharma, you know, protocols to, to stop certain things and what have you. If you could kind of synopsize your, your mission and your why now. So I have realized initially I didn't want to talk about any of this. Because there's a lot of shame around it. Um, because I made a lot of bad decisions that didn't just affect me, but affected others as well. And I wasn't proud of it. But then, finally, a, a close friend of mine asked me to go on his podcast because he, he said, this will reach more people than you think. There are more people that are going through these things. Like, different stories but they're having the same struggles that you've had, whether it be family issues, drug issues, whatever, or loss of identity, and they don't know how to get through it. And sometimes all they need to hear is that someone else has been there and there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Can you please come share this story? So I did. And, you know, the first time I didn't like being vulnerable. So it was a, a neatly packaged talk a manufactured yeah, yeah i said what i thought people wanted to hear yeah and i didn't let a lot of the dirty details out and i did have people come and say this is awesome i had a lot of really good feedback and then i got a phone call to go be on another podcast and so i let a little bit more of the dirt out and then another phone call came and i let a little bit more out to where now like 
it is what it is, man. Yeah. So, and so it was a gradual getting comfortable with it. It wasn't like a, an epiphany of like, yeah, I can let this go now. And I, I worried a lot about <laughs> what other people would think. Um, that was, that was my ego. Yeah. But the more vulnerable I get and the more of the shit that I talk about, the more people I have reach out and say, I needed to know yeah. that I wasn't alone in that. And so my why now is to create an impact in hopes that my peers or the younger generation or anybody, no matter what you're going through, hopefully I can share what worked for me and what that process, because what we didn't talk about is a lot of the growth that came from, from all that. I mean, it's, it's kind of self-explanatory, but there was a lot of hard decisions I had to make in order to get my life to where it is now. And, and I talk about that because I want to make it easier for the next guy so that before they're laying in the hospital, unsure if they're going to walk out of the hospital or before their marriage ends or before they're in their car ready to kill themselves, hopefully I can help give them some tools that can keep them from ever getting there. Yeah. Can you uh, give a laundry list of, of that or, or like how, how do you approach, let's say somebody reaches out and is like, man, what you're saying is resonating, but I don't know what the fuck to do. Like, where do you start with them? Asking them first, where are you? Where, like, no shit, where are you? And somebody says, like, are, I don't want to be alive. I don't, don't want to be like, do you have, you know, and it's, do you have a plan? Have you written notes? Have you started saying goodbye to people? First is, is identifying where you're at. Second is identifying what got you there, what led to that. After that's being willing to change that because whatever that was that got you there, that's, that's a negative contribution to your life. Sometimes though, it's hard to let go of negative contributions, especially if they're people that have been in your life for a long time, people that you really care about that maybe they just, you know, there's, it happens all the time. People stay in relationships with people that they care about because they've been there so long or because at one time they did serve them, but now it's turned into this toxic relationship, but we're so used to it and we're so comfortable with it that we don't want to let go of them because then that's the unknown. Mm -hmm. You know, what's life like without that person? So being willing to change it. So for me, it was, it was making lists. I sat, I couldn't get out of bed. I was in the hospital. I couldn't, there was an alarm on my bed because I kept disobeying the rules to stay in bed. And I'm like, they would all of a sudden be like, why the fuck is he walking around the hospital? So they put an alarm on my bed. And if I got out of bed, it would buzz until somebody came in. So, and physical stuff has always been my outlet. So I needed a new plan and I just started writing. I started making lists of the pros and cons. What do I have in my life that fans my fire? And what do I have that's putting my fire out? Mm -hmm. and, the, and at the same time, also establishing what I value, which ultimately leads to where do I want to be? What kind of person, what kind of man do I want to be? And... Then I started looking at that list of what is pushing me in the direction I want to be in and what's holding me back from it. And then it's being able to do the work and have the hard conversations to get rid of those people, to stop those habits, to implement new habits, to be disciplined enough to maintain those new habits. And yeah, that's... Are, are you, I mean, it's great stuff. Are you, are you working with any groups to develop a, like a program or a protocol or an outreach or, or is it right now just kind of grassroots, like trying to get that message out on different platforms such as this, or like, how are you going about it? So right now it's, it's getting out on platforms such as this, but I am in the background. I've been working with my friend, Danny. Um, he's the one that owns the gym I was coaching at mm -hmm. in Minnesota. He's the one that talked to the doctors, got them to look a little bit more deeply into my leg um, he's an amazing human being and he and I have actually been putting together a curriculum for, we've been working on it for about six months now 
And I think in October, we're going to launch our first beta program. We're going to select probably about six men to come do it with us. And eventually this will be open to women. Um, eventually it'll be open to civilian population. But initially for this first beta program, I'd like to bring five or six vets out. Yeah. And the plan is to put them through some hardship because that's the other thing is that's where growth comes from yeah. is, is going through hard shit. Yeah. And so we're going to go do rim to rim and back of the Grand Canyon. Oh, nice. In 24 hours and throughout, we're going to we're gonna talk about a lot of this stuff. And so eventually I would like to put together, whether it be annually or quarterly, if it escalates to quarterly, I'd like to do it in different regions so it's available to different people that can't necessarily travel to the, the Grand Canyon if you live in Maine. Yeah. Um, but get out there with people and be like, you know, have the conversations of where are you? What got you there? What yeah. can we do to get out of it? And yeah. then follow up. Yeah. yeah. Are, are you guys tying in with a nonprofit or are you creating one? To be determined. Yeah. Um, so right now I do a lot of work with a couple different nonprofits. Um, Bird's Eye View Project. I was a part of the 7X Project with yeah. them. And that was an amazing opportunity. And I'm going to continue to have that relationship with them. And then Hero Games Charity is is a big one I've worked with for the last two years, and they support Gold Star families, and that's near and dear to my heart. I think that every single one of those families should know that whether it's their son, their husband, their daughter, their wife, they all deserve to know that their loved one's story is not forgotten just because the war's over. Mm -hmm. um, so... I don't know. It might turn into something to support them. Um, yeah, it's that's that's a challenge. That's something I struggle with daily because if it were up to me, I want to give this away to as many people as I can for free. But at the end of the day, I got to eat too. Yeah, and so it's it's really hard to ask somebody to pay me to help them because ultimately, I just want to help as many people as I can. Yeah. No, it's tough. I mean, the nonprofit space is, is a strange double-edged sword that way, you know, because at the end of the day, it's still a business. Like the numbers still have to work, mm -hmm. you know, you can't mismanage, you know, funding or, or not take any in and, and, you know, that's all you're doing and not being compensated at least, you know, enough to fucking survive. So it, yeah, I mean, it can be tricky, but <clears throat> man, what a remarkable story you have. Um, you know, again, it's just like, story after story after story of you getting kicked in the nuts and, and overcoming and that, you know, it's just uh, man, what, what a path and what a journey. Um, I can't thank you enough for sharing it. Is there anything uh, that you would like to add to what we've already talked about? I think we covered it. Um, Is there anything I haven't asked you that I should have? <laughs> Not off the top of my head. You know, the, I can't remember if we talked about it, during the podcast or if it was in the conversation before, but um, don't let your circumstances take all the power yeah. from you. Don't, don't give them the power. Um, don't become a victim. Yeah. Things happen. They happen for a reason. Sometimes we don't understand that reason. And sometimes we have to search for that reason, but there's always a way to turn that into a learning experience and you can, come out better because of it yeah amen on that um how, how do people find you get a hold of you uh, help you do what you're doing or get involved um especially for when you guys do launch your uh, your your project so right now the only social media platform i have i have a youtube channel i think it's just zach garner or zachary garner i'll get back to you um <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll post it in the uh, but it's uh I post all of the podcasts that I've done videos for or any fundraising videos for projects that I'm working on get posted on there. And then Instagram is Zach next door. Zach next door. Yep. All right. That's is also it? my only fans page. All right. I'm kidding. I, you shouldn't be. <laughs> I'd sign up. Um, man, that's awesome. Well, uh, again, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story and, and, uh, in keeping in tradition with the mic drop podcast, we have a couple of, uh, 
parting gifts here for you. This is uh, from Champion Choice Silver and John Johnston out in California, always hooking us up. So I want to give you that, the, the customary or cursory uh, challenge coin oh, and, then, uh, and then a belt buckle that uh, signifies your time on here. So Dig it. yeah, but if you could show the camera just because uh, they're all different. Uh, they all have different, uh, you may want to lift it up just a little bit. Again, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for for fighting and and sticking with it. You know, I think your story is is powerful. It's inspiring, and uh, and it's important for so many people to hear your message and and learn from it and and be able to take from some of your experiences. So, uh, thank you for for sharing it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come out here and share it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to all the loyal mic drop listeners, uh, we appreciate you. I've had a couple of comments of of. Uh, on occasion, well, I don't tell you to choke yourself, so go ahead and choke yourself. Uh, I do hope you enjoyed this show. I know I sure did. And uh, most importantly, thank you for your continued support. Um, you know, I'm, I'm humbled every every show that comes out with the uh, the people that watch and comment and, and support us uh, week after week. So thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, until next time, this is Mike Drop. <laughs> <laughs>